Hello? Okay. Great. Uh, I'm going to get started since it's 11.40. Um, so, uh, okay, so welcome everyone uh, to our presentation. Thanks for coming. Uh, if you haven't guessed by the title, we're going to be spending some time today talking about uh, how you can use Zool for your own systems. Uh, and we're mainly going to be going over uh, why we moved to Zool um, and some of the benefits that came with it, especially compared to Jenkins, um, some fundamentals of Zool and how to onboard your own projects to Zool, um, and a retrospective of our Zool journey so far. So without further ado, more introductions. Uh, I'm Rich. Uh, this is Howard. We're both engineers on the Workday Private Cloud team, which we affectionately call WPC, um, but more on that later. Uh, so before we get into some of the technical weeds of uh, how we use Zool, uh, we just want to set some context for what Workday is for those of you who might not know. Um, so Workday provides cloud-based software for companies to manage their finance and HR more efficiently. So it sounds simple on the surface, but as you can see, we operate at quite a large scale. Um, Workday currently provides services to over half of the Fortune 500, and this amounts to over 60 million workers. Um, and Workday, on top of this, strives to maintain a customer satisfaction rating of over 95%, which we've successfully achieved for over a decade. So that's something that Workday really prides itself on. Um, so how do we achieve this level of scale and reliability at such a high rate? And of course, we use OpenStack, uh, if you haven't guessed. So uh, we began our OpenStack journey many years ago, starting with our first production clusters running Icehouse. Um, and since then, we could, you could say we've developed a bit of a bigger footprint. Um, we're a relatively small team inside of Workday, consisting of two development scrum teams and one SRE team. Uh, together, we run 87 clusters and growing. Uh, each cluster contains up to 300 compute nodes. And all in all, this amounts to 3.25 million cores, uh, 12 and a half petabytes of RAM, and 85,000 concurrent VMs. Um, we also hold ourselves accountable to a 99% API success rate during Workday's uh, several hour weekly maintenance window, uh, where we basically destroy and recreate the entire Workday stack. Um, so this amounts to 241,000 VMs recreated weekly, and as you can imagine, puts quite a lot of load on our control planes. Um, so given all this information, you can kind of start to see why Zool and CI is so important to us. Um, it's imperative that our platform stays extremely reliable um, so that we don't produce any kinds of regressions, either uh, from performance or deployment. Uh, we need to be accountable to our customers in our patch window. Um, so before we start talking about our current system, I kind of want to just talk a little bit about what we dealt with before we had Zool um, in our older version of WPC. And this should kind of help paint a picture of why we decided to transition to Zool. So note that some of this obviously isn't ideal, um, and it, we're putting it for the sake of comparison, but it's, it's something that worked for us at the time and scaled well for us enough. Um, but obviously we used Jenkins to run our CI. Um, we shared this with other teams in Workday, so there is another team that managed uh, Jenkins for us. It was great for maintenance overhead, but not great for flexibility and speed. Um, for instance, if you want to, to set up a new pipeline, you'd have to ask another team and wait several days um, to get back to you, and you just generally didn't have a lot of power. Um, we had limited jobs pre-merge, so basically a couple tests just to check a single patch and make sure that it seems okay. Um, and we relied on periodic jobs entirely for post-merge to catch any regressions. And the main part of this resulted in that all code was merged by hand. So it doesn't matter how and when you got a plus one from your CI or from another person giving you a plus two on your review, as long as you got it at some point, you could merge. So if someone reviewed your code on Friday, you could merge on Monday and just pray that it works. Um, and also we use Chef for our deployment. So this was a weekly point in time snapshots of Chef changes across multiple Workday teams, including our own. So uh, when we had to roll out changes, we'd roll out everyone's changes at once, including Workday infrastructure changes. Um, so feature and bug fix rollout was gated by config changes. Um, we didn't have any stable release branches, and we couldn't really do this at the time. <coughs> 
So given all these problems with our old CI, what kind of benefits does Zool bring us that can help? Uh, so the first one, as I mentioned before, is stable releases. So previously, because we used point-in-time snapshots for releasing, there wasn't really any need or even ability to branch. Um, but with Zool, we can enable an, uh, job variants and actually use branching to create stable releases. So this allows us to upgrade and roll back our code much more easily. Um, we can also release our own OpenStack-specific changes independently from company-wide changes, so we're not at the mercy of this big blob of point-in-time snapshot of Chef changes. Uh, portable jobs are great, too. Um, this essentially refers to the idea that, given any Zool job, you can run the same job across any repo to ensure that all changes are compatible. Um, so, for example, if you have repo A and repo B, and they're both used to build WPC, and we know that the same job works to test both of them, we can be much more confident that our changes uh, will not break our system in addition to testing cross-project dependencies, which we'll talk about a little more later. Um, Logging is another big thing. Uh, it's hard to understate how much easier it is to look at logs in Zool compared to Jenkins. Um, you can kind of expand and collapse your pre and post Ansible jobs, get like nice color-coded uh, Ansible hints for which tasks may have been skipped or passed or failed. Whereas Jenkins is just like this huge blob of text that it just executes a thing and you have to manually search for errors um, in kind of this really uh, not user-friendly way. <coughs> so even better, uh, we found it useful to create our own R server at some point uh, for further Ansible logging, but we can talk about that a bit more later. Um, Gating is probably one of the most important parts of Zool. Um, as we mentioned before, we kind of had like a semi-manual version of project gating in Jenkins. Like we would allow our test suite to run first, but we still ended up merging the code by hand. Um, but now we're, we've gone past the days where uh, we can have two incompatible changes that can break our CI because of uh, race conditions when changes were merged. So for example, in kind of what I was getting at before, if we have uh, two developers, they get plus ones on like a Friday, and their code looks good to them, they merge on Monday, and then suddenly those two changes break each other, that doesn't happen to us anymore. So it allows us to take advantage of a parallel speculative execution of our tests, um, and we move much quicker, and we don't break things nearly as much. Um, auto hold's also really useful. Um, in Jenkins, we kind of had pretty limited control over uh, our system due to not being the owners. So if a job failed, there usually wasn't really much we could do besides kind of just rerun the tests or make some changes and see what happened again in Jenkins. But with Zool, you can actually auto-hold your nodes in the event of a failure. So this helps solve the age-old riddle of, well, it works on my machine, why doesn't it work in the CI? Because you can actually pause the CI and look at it and see exactly what's happening and run the same commands. Um, and of course, all of this culminates in fewer blockages and happier developers, which is great. And anecdotally, our on-call shifts have seen much fewer breakages in our CI, which is great. Um, and it's pretty noticeable. I don't have data to back that up, but you can hopefully take my word for it. So I'll hand over to Howard. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> We kind of look at this uh, as kind of a two-part conference talk. Last uh, last time in Ber Berlin, we talked quite a bit about our uh, migration platform on how we converted our uh, OpenStack CI part to, uh, to to using Zool. Today, the rest of the talk, uh, we wanted to kind of talk about how you can kind of use it and how you can make you know non-OpenStack projects in Zool as well. So uh, the the crux of this is you, you ought to use Zool. Now, while we uh, need to assume you have a Zool system, I figured it'd be pretty good if I uh, just kind of showed a simplified layout. You notice that uh, Zool has to use Garrett, so you've got to have a Garrett system running because that's where it's going to pull it on, and uh, it's going to check out different changes and branches of each of your projects there, and then it actually farms this off using Ansible out to um, uh, out, out to these ephemeral uh, nodes. Uh, we use VMs for ours. They're just OpenStack VMs that we spin up for these kind of processes. And then it, you know, Ansible calls it. So 
let's show a few things that you need to know to kind of convert your existing job over to Zool. So um, in your project, why is there? Okay, here we go. Sorry, there's a blank screen. In your project, you, you create a Zool.d directory, and it has two files in it. There's a job. Uh, the jobs file defines the jobs, you know, linting, unit tests, publishing, anything that uh, along those lines. Then there's a project file, and this references those jobs for the various pipelines, like check, gate, post, after merging that thing. Then, uh, then you create the jobs. Now, most of the jobs are Ansible playbooks, but we'll talk about a nice talks layer that you can use. Now, this is an example project file. I tried to make it interesting, and I may have opened up more questions here. I'm doing a release inside of a gate. This relies on delegating secrets, um, which I'm going to talk about later. You should probably uh, trigger your releases for the post-merge pipelines, not during the gate here. But keep in mind that pipelines come in two flavors. <sighs> There are pre- and post-merge, and some things like secrets are only available in post-merge uh, code pipelines. You generally want to keep your pipelines as uh, similar to each other. That eliminates some of the problems that you might have, like there's an error, and you don't know whether it's your code change or whether an environment change or whether something that's being integrated changed. So keep the pipelines uh, or the jobs uh, the similar. Now, this is uh, an example project file. Uh, okay, there, here's the jobs file. So here's my example jobs file. The names are references from the, pipe, uh, the project file, and they each specify one or more playbooks. Note that the playbooks uh, run somewhat in isolation, so it's difficult to pass state from one uh, playbook to the next, even if it's part of the same job. Now, uh, a playbook called by Zool can do, you know, all the normal stuff that Ansible does. Um, now, note that you can't become root on localhost because that, as you saw in that initial architecture thing, that's the executor. So most of these things you'll want to have as on the builder. Rich, you want to talk about talks? So if you're not using Ansible and you want to go with a pure Python project, uh, Tox is a great way to run tests for your project. Um, for those of you who don't know what Tox is, uh, a quick summary is, in general, Tox is a framework that helps you standardize your uh, Python testing environments. So for example, let's say you need to maintain your Python project for multiple versions of Python. Uh, you can set up the test environment appropriately uh, based on each version, uh, so install dependencies particular to those Python versions, and run your test to ensure that you haven't broken your project for some other version of Python. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty simple to set up Tox, honestly. Uh, you pretty much just define a Tox.ini file in your project, and then you can call it using the Tox CLI. Um, so in this example, notice that we set up a linter environment and a unit test environment for Python 3.8. Um, and note that even if your project is not pure Python, uh, you can still at least take advantage of using it as a linter, especially in conjunction with Zool, because it kind of sets it all up for you. So for example, if you want to lint some Ansible playbooks, you can use Tox for that too. Um, so it's not limited to just Python, even though that's probably its best use case. Um, yeah, so uh, this is pretty much all you do to set it up. Uh, once your Tox.ini is done, you just set up in your project.yaml, uh, you call the Tox linters and the Tox uh, Python environments, whichever ones you've set up, and Zool kind of figures out the rest for you. And this is what happens when you're able to leverage existing community built jobs on Zool, um, which is really great for us. It's made ourselves a lot more efficient, and we can like pick and choose what works for us uh, from the community. Um, so if you're kind of wondering you know, how this works, um, because I know, I know I've kind of abstracted a lot of it and just said, oh yeah, just put this here and put this here and everything just works together. Uh, we can talk a little bit about how it works under the hood just so you have an idea. Um, so how Zool generally works is that it has a set of pre and post Ansible jobs that set up and tear down the system. So this kind of helps keep the logic of your tests separated from the Zool internals. 
So you can have any number of pre and post jobs that get called in a hierarchy, which we show on the next slide. Um, but uh, all jobs have some amount of privilege set up, like uh, setting up SSH keys or getting the change ID from Garrett. So you can see that's in step one. Um, and then in step two and three, Tox runs its own unprivileged uh, pre, post, and base jobs to do its own setup and teardown and running the tests. So uh, it calls bind up to install the binary dependencies, and then it actually does the job of installing pip and tox. And then uh, it finally calls the tests in the linters. Um, and then finally, after all of that's done, uh, the privilege phase uh, from the trusted base job uh, uploads the logs to Zool. So again, it's all kind of done for you. Uh, you can look at it in, at the upstream jobs. Like uh, I know like uh, if people send commits to the gate in uh, the open dev repositories, you can just honestly click on the Zool jobs there and see what it's doing. Uh, and you can kind of mirror uh, what's happening there to your own system. So it's a great example to follow. Um, so here kind of what I was alluding to before, uh, here's like our Zool job hierarchy. Um, you can see every job has a parent job, which may have its own parent job, et cetera, and uh, until it gets to the base, which runs your actual tests. So you can see the tox run.yaml is basically where your actual tests are run, but everything else is all the setup and teardown. Um, and again, each parent can have one or more of these pre and post jobs. Um, notice how some of these jobs are trusted, uh, and I kind of alluded it to before when I was mentioning privilege and unprivileged jobs, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, so yeah, now that you've got your test set up in either Ansible or Tox, um, let's say you want to test your inter-product dependencies, so one of the coolest parts of Zool. So uh, all you do in, is uh, in your jobs.yaml, you define your acquired projects, so that's kind of in the bold in the, towards the center of the slide. Um, in this case, we're requiring that we need to have the myproj RPM build uh, dependent. Um, and then in your commit message for your separate change, all you do is you literally put uh, depends on and then the actual uh, Garrett URL of your change. And then what this does is uh, Zool creates a directory for the running job and it checks out all of the required projects as instructed. So if you have a depends on defined, it will check out that change specifically. Um, otherwise, it'll just default to the main branch or pretty much any branch that you're setting a commit to. So say you're just sending a commit to uh, a stable release branch for a bug fix, uh, it'll check out those branches too. So uh, yeah, the inter-project dependencies works great. Um, <coughs> and then as a bonus, uh, for those of you who use Cola, uh, this works seamlessly with Zool, and it's, it's designed to work this way, which is really great, and it works uh, great for our setup. So uh, for those of you who may or may not know, uh, in colabuild.conf, you have a specific syntax that you would use in order to install dependencies to your images. So it's kind of that crossed out thing there as an example. Um, so in that example, we're trying to install this myproj RPM to all heat images. Um, so you may be initially tempted to do <laughs> what is in the crossed out version, but note that this is actually terrible practice. You should not do this. This is, you're defeating the purpose of Zool if you, if you do this. Um, you don't want to be tempted to directly install packages from a static source URL. Instead, what works really great for us is uh, we have uh, a templated out cola build.conf using Jinja, and then we loop over all of the source names that we've checked out in Zool on any of our depends on commits, and then we install from disk instead. And it's really important to install from disk because this will actually properly test uh, your cross-project dependencies. Whereas if you were just <laughs> testing from this URL, you're just gonna get the same thing every time and you're not actually testing the dependencies. Um, Zool will check out all of the required repos into a specific directory per job run to run the tests. Um, and in the past, like we, we kinda had to like unlearn this huge clunky flow we had with Jenkins, uh, especially for repos that did generate packages and RPMs. Like we used to have an entire workflow where uh, the job or the repo would generate the RPM, we'd upload it to a repository, package repository, and then consume it later in our periodic jobs. And this is just like a whole mess. And it's something we actually had to unlearn how to do because it was bad practice and it defeated the purpose of Zool. Um, so that's just kind of a quick bonus uh, for Cola integration. So 
Um, now, unlike uh, Jenkins, Zool doesn't have a vault of shared secrets for all jobs, and that's by design. As often, uh, secrets in Jenkins would accidentally be, you know, leaked to the logs, and uh, Zool's publicly available, so you don't want to have something like that. So while uh, these tools are available, Zool kind of forces you to think through how you want to share secrets and, how, and just use the secrets. So as we talked about before, some jobs uh, are trusted and some are not. You can see this in this screenshot of the, just the last few projects on our Zool system. Untrusted jobs are meant to be jobs that you test before merging. Um, the trusted config jobs, they're the opposite. They're tested after merging. So, well, don't worry too much about this, but just note that the Zool base jobs here, um, the Zool base jobs here are, are kind of the ones that can access encrypted data and make it available to other untrusted jobs. But typically, you put your secrets in the project that needs them. So, Let's do this, the Zool client CLI. It's a lot like the Ansible vault command, um, if you're familiar with that. It allows you to kind of encrypt something into a YAML formatted data structure. However, it uses a, a public key uh, rather than symmetric encryption. And then we can take that output and just drop it into our secrets YAML file. And then in our post, uh, or in our uh, playbooks, we now have that stuff available, but only in the post-merge pipeline. That is uh, the periodic jobs, uh, post, tag pipelines, those that happen after merging. Um, now in our case, we actually wanted to have the same secrets available to all 200 plus projects that we had, because some were publishing RPMs to um, our, repositor our repositories and things like that. So we had kind of a slightly different twist on this. So typically the Zool executor has access to those uh, collection of secrets. We put it in the Zool base jobs and it can run these trusted playbooks from, from this project. Now if you run this playbook, uh, on a given worker node here, the playbook can then issue a Docker login or you know something equivalent to uh, to establish a connection to the trust to a trust store, and then untrusted playbooks executing later then have access to this. Um, now, very similar to what we did before, we can encrypt the secret, but this time we're going to put it in the, uh, the Zool base jobs. And then uh, in the base jobs, jobs YAML file, we're going to reference that secret that we just added. Now, note, when we run the untrusted playbook, that secret won't be there anymore. So what we need to do is use a, a delegate. Um, so and I'm afraid this is gonna be a homework exercise for each of you, because you're gonna to have to use your own system and your own trust stores to get to, uh, to put those secrets on those, um, those build nodes. It's kind of a risky procedure, so uh, best if you can kind of create a temporary short-lived password uh, or token with the longer one that you've stored in, your, um, yeah, in the, the secret playbook. So, Summarize. <coughs> yeah, so we'll leave you guys with a quick retrospective and summary of uh, our journey with Zool so far. Um, so, sorry. So despite all of the good we've experienced uh, migrating to Zool, it is worth highlighting some pitfalls and pain points you might have if you are considering this migration for yourself. Um, as you can tell, and as I mentioned before, we, we no longer have a dedicated team to manage our CI. Um, so uh, the, uh, the automation for uh, deploying Zool itself is pretty minimal. Um, we kind of just threw something together really fast in like a month or two, and it surprisingly worked really well to the point where we actually, it was so stable, we actually didn't need to touch it again, hence why some of our automation is actually kind of lacking. Um, it's something that we're trying to uh, work on fixing, but nonetheless, it's the current state of things for us. Um, as a result, because our playbooks are not quite as good, 
um, we don't upgrade as frequently as we would like. So we are using a bit of an older version of Zool, and that is something that we intend to fix at some point as well. Um, also for us in particular, uh, we don't have a great uh, integration with company tools like Jira, Slack, Confluence, et cetera, because we were just so focused on getting our OpenStack running and our own Zool running that like, you know, we, we don't have time to figure this stuff out. It's something that another team would be great at figuring out, but we just have too many things to do. Um, another thing that we kind of noticed too, and in, in, in part of how we we're fast we we're moving, is uh, we we're noticing we we're having kind of some significant drift between Zool and our in-house bare metal uh, Ansible orchestration tool. So think basically Ansible Tower essentially to deploy our own clusters. Um, we noticed that uh, most of our breakages were happening in our bare metal integration. So like while Zool itself was great and the playbooks were stable, um, they didn't match closely enough to what we did in bare metal, uh, which meant that uh, Zool and in-house Ansible tool for ourselves were not entirely compatible. Um, and again, this is partially because of how fast we were able to move. Um, the, these things kind of came uh, out of sync with each other. Um, again, this is something that we're working hard on correcting, but things are in a much better place than they are before. Um, yeah, and Workday also has uh, many company-specific steps which we need to follow to set up our infrastructure. So even simple things like calling Cola Ansible within our own Ansible led us to creating our own uh, RS server where we could more easily view logs and diagnose problems. So even more things that we had to set up. Uh, but despite this, I would say Zool is overall great. Um, so a pain point was we don't have a dedicated team to manage our CI, but a win is we don't have a dedicated team to manage our CI. Uh, we get to do everything ourselves. We have so much power, um, and we can move really, really fast. Uh, if you want a new project, you don't have to wait for like a few days for another team to help set up things for you. You just do it yourself. It takes five minutes, and it's amazing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we manage concurrent stable releases using branches, so we don't have this big chef blob of code anymore. We can actually release code in an intelligent and safe way, um, and we can release changes uh, that uh, are not, or we don't have to depend on uh, other teams' uh, changes anymore. Um, and uh, as I kind of alluded to before, like some of the things we were fixing and working hard on fixing, like we have done some pretty major overhauls, honestly, of our release pipeline several times, and we didn't block anybody. Um, honestly, I feel like if we were doing this in Jenkins, we would have broken things to the point where it's like it would have taken a while to fix, but Zool made it really easy to refactor. Um, some caveats of Zool that are worth noting if you do decide to uptake Zool for your own use case. Um, again, it might not matter for you, but it's some things that affected us um, and are notable. <coughs> so Zool, as you can kind of tell, is really, really good at CI. It's great at that, but that means it's not great at executing ad hoc tasks. Um, for example, we did have some automation, uh, for example, if we want to onboard new teams to our cloud. Um, and we ran this by kicking off an ad hoc job in Jenkins. Um, while we still have to migrate this away from Jenkins, Zool isn't really a logical place to put it because it's more for CI and not for running ad hoc tasks. So you still do need like Ansible Tower or some other kind of Ansible executor uh, to handle these situations. Um, also note that Zool does have a fairly high barrier to entry in terms of resources. Uh, the node pool is pretty expensive. Um, it creates a lot of VMs for us and offers quite a bit of churn in our clusters. Um, but note that we already had a pretty solid version of OpenStack running on WPC, so we were able to just stick our node pool there and use our existing resources. So that wasn't a problem for us. Um, and the Jenkins secret chest store isn't great, but at least kind of provides you some infrastructure to manage your secrets. Even though it's still not super secure, you could just log your secrets. Um, Zool kind of discourages you from following any of these sketchy patterns at all by not even giving you the option to do this. So it tends to try to guide you towards uh, setting up actual secure external trust stores instead. <coughs> so finally, in the spirit of Canada, we'll leave you with some random lessons we learned. Um, a CI is no substitute for a developer workflow. 
Um, just because you're zo using Zool doesn't mean your system's magically gonna be more resilient. You still do have to write tests and configure Zool to use the correct patterns, as we mentioned, like installing from disk. Uh, every test you hook in the pipeline is an investment that will pay off later. And if you have flaky and slow jobs, you definitely wanna chase those down. Uh, periodic tests are still useful, despite the fact that we have gating now. Um, the check, gate, and periodic pipelines all work together to kind of isolate where a failure may have come from, either a developer's review, the environment, or from multiple incompatible changes. And finally, we want to emphasize uh, that the benefits of Zool far outweigh the initial learning curve. It's still honestly kind of shocking how fast we were able to move. Like, we were able to create our own source control and CI without having to depend on another team in like a month or two. And it almost seemed too ambitious, but we did it. Um, and you guys can do it too. So uh, the amount of time we spent setting up Zool has definitely been paid back in developer hours and confidence that our changes are more resilient. And setting up new projects and jobs gets easier with practice, uh, as we've kind of shown you. So yeah, that's, that's it for us. Uh, I don't know if we have too much time for questions, but thank you for joining our presentation. Yeah, well, I think it's time to run, but uh, we can take questions out in the hall. <laughs>